Mr. Johan Hurry, welcome hey, to the Tom. show. Good to be with you. Cool, cool, cool. How's uh, how's everything going in Australia so far? Do you know, until I turned thirty-five, I thought jet lag was a myth. Hang you know, on, you told me off the air you were twenty-four. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Johan. Until like four years ago, when I turned thirty-five, I genuinely thought jet lag was a myth. When yeah. we talked about it, I was like, "What do they even mean? What are yeah. they doing?" <laughs> and now I get fucking crippled when I arrive at Australia. <sighs> but I love Australia, so it's easy. It's Australians make it easy to recover from jet lag. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, we uh, we have to do our thing for the world, I think, and if we we can do one thing. It's um, helping the jet lag community. Exactly. <laughs> it's shocking. It. Did you do anything to, um, I don't know, like boost your uh, energy levels in, in terms of that? Like a cold shower in the morning or something? Or? No, this is why I feel really ashamed being on a fitness podcast. It's like asking me to go on a podcast where they speak Polish or something. Yeah. I'm <laughs> so removed from the concept yeah, of yeah, yeah. physical fitness at the moment. Yeah. But, uh, I had a period where I went through exercising a lot. And now, last year, I've been an absolutely lazy cunt, so no, unfortunately, I can't, I'm in no position to comment on no. fitness of any kind. Maybe emotional fitness a little bit, yeah, but physical fitness, fitness yeah, true. yeah. My niece, when, when, when I was about, God, this is years ago, when my, when my niece was about six, she, one day she was drawing me and my mum, and she looked at me very seriously, she said, Johan, you know when adult, when children draw adults, you just do a big circle and put a little face in the middle, and I said, yeah, and she said... That's not good, is it? Because actually adults don't look like that. <laughs> and I said, oh, Erin, that's a really good... I thought, oh, she's learning about perspective. That's yeah. really good. She looked very seriously and said, but the great thing about you is you actually do look <laughs> like that. So it makes you really easy to draw. Look, my picture is so accurate. Yeah, it's yeah. like, fuck you. I <laughs> hate you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I'm actually she grew up to be nice. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Oh, but so, sure. yeah, my, as my round, moomin-like face shows, <laughs> sadly, I'm alien to fitness or nutrition of any kind. So, no, no what I've done is I've consumed enough caffeine to kill a field of fucking cows yeah yeah and i have uh what else have i done that does I help have, i think it was basically caffeine walking oh and valium the best drug in the oh, world yeah yeah which just knocks you out yeah, yeah. yeah. So. i've actually never i've never had valium before like i've best drug ever i now yeah. understand why my mother was weirdly calm all through my childhood the um <laughs> exactly. no the the <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it just kind of, well, to be clear... No, we're not, yes. I'm not advocating. Not yeah, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Right. But if you use it very occasionally, yeah. <laughs> if you use it very occasionally, it just knocks you out and you don't... Melatonin makes me feel groggy the next day. Yeah. Whereas Valium, I don't feel... You wake up and you don't... You just feel like you've had a good sleep rather yeah. than like you've been drugged. Well, they say, I mean, it's... I've, I've, I actually just had a... I got a tattoo on the weekend, but... um. What does it? What is it of? It's uh, it's just here. Actually. I'll show you. It's just that one little there. Oh my god! It's um, laugh now, laugh later. Keep death in the awareness of consciousness, which is actually a quote by Ram Dass, who's a spiritual tycoon. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's to don't want to make it about me, but um, I used to always have a massive fear of death, and a lot of my tattoos were about um, overcoming that anxiety towards death, and um. You know, after after going through a couple of years of just trying to work on myself a little bit and get to know myself a little bit more, um, I've grown to really love the concept because it's allowed me to, I guess, live uh, life with a bit more vibrancy. So I thought I'd chuck it on the chest, nice and close to the heart. Yeah, that's the tattoo. There's an Ingmar Bergman film where the um, uh, one of the characters says, "Death is like the black backing of a mirror, without which we can see nothing." Mm. And I, I used to have a similar kind of fear of death. And, mm. and the more I, the more it's kind of related to, although I don't really write about it in the book, it's um, my most recent book. But mm. yeah, it's something I thought about a lot as well. That's really interesting. Yeah. What was it specifically about death that I guess frightened you? Or It's the unknown really, isn't it? For me, it was the uncertainty. And uh, I guess um, I made a distinction, you know, with, with uh, from what helped with me. I had all these other anxiety issues, but um, maybe because death is an uncertainty to us, you know, the brain just for me anyway, had a real issue with uncertainty because it could have meant danger. So there was like a, some sort of intertwining or overlapping experience between danger and fear. But yeah. and that's interesting. It wasn't that for me because yeah. I've never had any... Da- uh, th- I've always been and still am a total atheist in the sense mm. of I have no fear of being dead. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Being dead, you're dead. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. it. It's a state of nothingness. I'm no more afraid of being dead than I'm afraid of what I was before I was alive, which yes. was non-existent. No, for me, it's about the... Re- and I think one of the reasons why I'm less frightened of it now is about the relationship to ego, right? Mm. So... I remember, you know, Benazir Bhutto, the former Pakistani prime minister. Yeah. So she, she was away from Pakistan for like nine years. She goes back to Pakistan to fight the election. And um, she lands back. There's a big crowd at the airport. She walks into the crowd and a suicide bomber attacks the crowd. Mm. And I forget how many, I think 20 people died that day. 
And the next day she goes out again into these crowds and again and again and again. And then after two weeks, another suicide bomber blew her up and she, she, was, she was murdered. And Man. I remember speaking to someone who knows Benazir Bhutto, knew Benazir Bhutto fairly well. Uh, around that time, whenever she died, it was 2000 and I forget, 2010, I think. Mm. And saying, how could... I bet it was not an admirable person in some ways, but I think she was genuinely brave. And I was saying, you know, how could she do that? Mm. How could she do something so obviously risking death? And, and my, my friend who knew her said, but you've got to understand, his friend who'd lived in Pakistan for a long time, mm. said, you've got to understand she had a sense of being part of something that is bigger than her individual life and her ego, right? Absolutely. She, she sees herself as part of a long story. Her father had been hanged. He'd been the prime minister. Again, not particularly admirable man. So mm. it's not, I'm not particularly praising the Butos, but sure. uh, her, her dad had been hanged uh, by, you know, the, for political reasons. Um, her, several members of her family had been murdered for political reasons. She had a sense of, well, I'm part of this big movement that will go on after my life and my death may even be a contribution to yeah. this, this, this ongoing thing. And to me, obviously, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be killed by a bomb, hopefully, but yeah. the, the relationship to, to me, it was about relationship to ego. There's this, do you know the American philosopher Ayn Rand? Terrible, I don't know. awful cunt. Um, massively praised by American right-wingers. She wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. Okay. She's like a big hero to people like... Um, like a lot of Republicans mm. and she was a complete egotist and she viewed death with total terror, right? Yep. She said uh, something like, I won't die, the world will end. That's how narcissistic she was, right? <laughs> oh, wow. um, but if you think about it, the more <laughs> egotistical and narcissistic you are, I think the more death is profoundly terrifying because if all that matters is you, it's well, true. you will end, so right? True. Yep. So one of the things I think as I've become... I think my relationship with death, it could be a totally different thing that's going on with mm. you, but the, the, my relationship to death, I think has become a lot more relaxed as I've become, I'm still fairly egotistical, but as I've become less egotistical, I view the idea of death with less anxiety and mm. terror. Uh, yeah, I think that's what's going on with, with me. It's yeah. like, well, you know, I will see, st I think about people I've loved who've died, like my grandmother who brought me up and I think, well, my grandmother no longer exists in a physical sense. I don't believe her spirit physically exists anywhere anymore. Mm. And her body obviously doesn't. Mm. But, uh, you know, there are lots of times when I will do something nice for someone and I'll think of my grandmother and my grandmother's example and how she taught me to do that. Mm. And I think in that sense, my grandmother is still alive. Not mm. in any literal sense, but in a, you know, uh, you could say spiritual sense is alive in those moments, mm. right? And I think, you know, if you can think about living on in that sense and having an effect on people now and, you know, and, and just being, if you're nice to people that can create, so, you know, cycles of kindness in the same way that if you're cruel, that can create cycles of cruelty. I think mm. that if you think about life as part of a long process like that, um, where you're just a very small part of a much bigger, I recently went to Memphis and I went to the, um, I took one of my nephews there and, um, I went, um, I went to where Dr. King was murdered. Oh, in wow. The Lorraine Motel. Yeah. Which has now been turned into this absolutely incredible civil rights museum. Yeah, great. And there's this, um, there's this totally incredible bit next to, the whole thing is amazing, but there's this bit next to, just next to the balcony where he was murdered mm. by this fucking racist. Mm. Um, and he was really young. He was 39 years old. Um, there's this incredible... Um, quote from him from about f six or seven months before he was murdered and he he knew he was going to be murdered right when he was a very realistic child I mean, he had in fact been stabbed before he, <laughs> yeah. he kept being nearly killed they yeah. firebombed his house and he's asked something like how would you like to be remembered right and he says various things but there's this line that really hit me where he said um, I would like to rem be remembered as someone who tried to love someone else. And to me, what I thought was so interesting is the way he phrased it. It's not, I'd like to remember to someone who loved people. Yeah. It's, I'd like to remember to someone who tried to love someone else. Because mm. to me, that was so, that's something that acknowledges how hard it is to really love people. Mm. It's not a kind of cheap, sentimental, easy thing about, oh, we'll all connect. Mm. All. It's that it's hard to connect with mm. people. It's hard to love people. It's work to love people. It's not easy. No. But it's the most rewarding thing you can do. You can do, and I've been thinking a lot about that since I, since I was in Memphis. Yeah. yeah, man, I love that. It's great because 
I guess the thing that I get from that straight away is that um, he's drawing on the significance of intent. And intent is something that shines through with anything we do in life. You know, it's that thing of, great, you know, I mean, even from a young, you know, as a young age, we all remember when, um, I mean, we actually used to get graded based on how hard we worked as opposed to what the actual grade was. And I remember sometimes I'd get like, um, you know, probably moving on to my egotistical side for a second. I'm pretty good, mate. <laughs> but <laughs> you get like a B plus or something for, for the actual job you did. But the, the actual intent and how tr- how hard I tried on it was a, a C and a D. It, you know, it, it it's always so much better to see someone that's really trying hard to make a difference as opposed to someone that just genuinely has it, you know. That's insane, especially considering how hard that bloke must have had it. And, you know, I, I, think, I, I think it was, um, I was listening to Mel Robbins' book, there was a five second rule. And she drawed upon an example of someone that was just taken into the spotlight of going, hey, five, four, three, two, one, you know, this is you now. And apparently, um, Dr. King was one of those people that I think from memory, he actually may have even had a fear of public speaking, you know, and he was a guy that literally, literally changed the world, you know, because he was like, hey, there's something out there that's way more important than myself. And I've, I've got to do whatever I can just to make a difference, you know, just absolutely beautiful. I love that you brought up um, ego. Ego is um, very interesting, and we were talking about before the show just how it guides you. And I think the first question I wanted to ask you um, on the on the show officially, because we could talk for hours, but um, at the start of the book, you were talking about how you know you were first clinically diagnosed with depression and all this sort of stuff. Do you feel knowing that what you know now, and then going back to those moments, like what would you what would you tell yourself as someone uh, with a yeah. bit of hindsight and a bit That's of reflection? That's a really good. Good question. So I was a teenager. I went to my doctor in in London, and I remember. Uh, I think I put it this way at the time. I don't. Know, this is just me remembering. It. I mm. remember set. I think I remember. You've always got to be careful with your memories from so long ago. But mm. um, talking about how I felt like pain was kind of leaking out of me, and I couldn't control it or regulate it, and. This was the the late nineties, so there was a lot of talk about depression at that time Mm. and my doctor told me this totally biological story about why I felt this way there are real biological components to depression but he told an entirely biological story he said you know we know why people feel like this there's a chemical called serotonin in people's brains it makes them feel good some people are naturally lacking it you're clearly one of them Mm. all you need is these drugs and you're going to feel fine Mm. And I started taking these drugs and I did feel a lot better for a time. And then this feeling of pain came back. I thought it was something weird about me. I actually discovered that's perfectly normal. Um, I went back. He gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. Again, the feeling of pain came back. I was kind of in this cycle. So I was taking the maximum possible dose for 13 years. The end of which I was still depressed. felt like shit. had horrible physical side effects. Yeah. Um, the, thing I wish, the thing I wish had been the starting point... Hmm. In that conversation, the thing that I would say if I could go back in time would be your pain makes sense, yeah. right? This is not a glitch in a computer program. It's not a, just a flaw in your biological coding. You feel like this for a reason. Mm. Those reasons are totally understandable. And what you need is help and support I would I, to, to deal with the reasons why you feel this way. And I think I would try to talk about, so there are lots of things going on with me. But yeah, because if you start from that, because what my doctor was saying is basically, it doesn't mean anything that you feel this way, yeah. right? It's a signal. It's like a, a, you know, I remember, obviously I spent a lot of my time in the US, mm. although I'm, as you can tell from my weird down to down voice, I'm British, but, the, <laughs> but I, remember, show, mate. <laughs> so, I remember when, I remember when I first went to the US in my early 20s. I remember really clearly a friend of my, an American friend of mine, who I'm still friends with, get, uh, eating and an American friend of mine giving me an indigestion pill, which doesn't exist in... Do they exist in Australia? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've never... I mean, we had probiotics and things. Right. Um, but they're really got, common in the US. <laughs> Actually, you know what, mate? <laughs> 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 no, they're, they're really common in the US, right? Really, perfectly normal people yeah. like you and me will literally just offer you indigestion pills while you're really? like, abysmal. And I remember the first time someone offered it to me Gee, saying, man. but wait a minute... Indigest, even, and I was, I was eating a lot at that stage. Mm. I think it, I mean, indigestion isn't a malfunction, right? Yeah. Indigestion is a evolved biological signal to yeah. tell you you're eating too fast. Yeah, that's right. The, the solution to that is to eat more slowly. And actually, if you 
override that signal, if you ignore it mm. or act like it's a, some kind of flaw, mm. actually you're going to eat too much. You're going to feel like shit. You're going to um, you're going to damage your digestion. L- listen to the. I don't think I would have said this entire little speech, but yeah. I remember thinking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Like listen to the signal, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just wanted to take a fucking pill, mate. Yeah, but, they, that's right. but, but 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 I remember in a, in a similar way. Now, obviously, look, depression is the worst thing I've ever experienced. It's much worse than than indigestion. But I think that principle of like, don't pathologize the signal, mm. listen to the signal. Mm. And it's interesting to see, it was so interesting going around, you know, for, for my book, Lost Connection. So I went and met with experts all over the world on what causes depression, anxiety, and what solves them. And the thing that I kept hearing in different forms from all these different experts, and this is the position of the World Health Organization, mm. the leading medical body in the world, right? The, the, the depression, as the World Health Organization puts it, depression is a social indicator. It has social causes and it needs social as well as individual solutions, right? Mm-hmm. If you've been told this totally biological story, it sounds like, what, what the fuck are they even talking about? Yeah, right? yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's right. Yeah. It's, it's so fascinating. I think, um, you know what? The, the biggest thing I got from your book was how retarded am I that I don't already know this shit? You know, like there were so many things, even at the very start of it, it was just like, hey, you know, listen to your body. That the I can't remember who it was that you were in Vietnam, mm. and it was saying, you know, this is a sign, or this was a listen. It's giving you a message, you know. And I think um, maybe that that's from my take of actually getting a bit more mindful and practicing meditation. But um, we really just have become so disconnected, you know. And it, it's just a very easy way to go. Take this for this. Take this for this. Take this for this. You know, it's it's a it's a really it's, I feel like it's almost quite sad, you know? You're totally right because there's, it's so right to talk, there's this thing that, before the book came out, I remember having dinner with a friend of mine and <laughs> saying, the thing I was most frightened about about mm. the book is that people would read it and go, well, no shit, Sherlock, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's really fucking obvious, yeah. right? Like, of course, there's lots of details, lots of stories of in the book people wouldn't know and lots of specific things, particularly about the solutions people might not know. Mm. But I thought, if you, I bet if we go back in time and say to your grandmother or my grandmother, hey, Graham, do you think if people are really lonely and they hate their work and they feel really oh. financially insecure, they're more or less likely to become depressed? Yeah. My grandmother said, you thick cunt, get out of my yeah. room, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but what... Then the book came out yeah. and I had this slightly surreal experience, which is kind of the opposite. Well, I kept being introduced to the interviews and say, and now we're going to talk to Johan Hari, who's written this incredibly controversial new book mm. in which people would react with like incredulity to what I was saying. I mean, it's so, and it was really interesting to me. How did, so in a way, and it made me think again about the journey of the book. Mm. How did we become so disconnected from yeah. these things that are so obvious how did we how did not every aspect of it is obvious but a lot of it is yep. it's intuitive to people that's right yes. how did we become so disconnected from our own intuitions about how and why we feel the way we do I think that's a really interesting massive question. it's absolutely massive but I think it, there's a there's a it's difficult and I guess you know I genuinely believe that I wouldn't be um, interested in this sort of stuff so I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you you know um, if I didn't go through it myself and I think um, one thing that's so important I'm I'm very thankful for is the fact that I did get hit with a mental health issue. And so it thrust me on this journey to actually learn more about myself, you know, but there are many people out there that just kind of have this normalized, maybe they're just less biologically predisposed to anxiety or depression or whatever it is, you know, you mentioned before there are some sort of um, biological um, things that can occur as well. And they go through this life without ever really knowing um, that there is this other side to it, you know, but so did what, how, how old were you when you had that? I was 20 I was 21 but it came from uh, a mushrooms experience I um, jumped into some psychedelics and I'd be doing them for a fair while for um, 18 months two years before that but that just shortcut me to just this complete ego death where I was like oh shit I literally don't know who I am and it was a harrowing experience but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned about how fucked I was living my life and I wasn't even living it that badly like I'm not saying I was a drug addict I'm not saying I was like a murderer um, but I have locked the door, mate. So, <laughs> but, fuck! I knew this was going to yeah, end like that's this. Right. That's actually not coke, what you drink it. <laughs> well, I mean, it kind of is. <laughs> but look, it, it was this whole thing where I was like, "Oh wow, I just don't even know who I am," and I needed to. But I'm so thankful for that because it taught me that, you know, and I can even look back on myself ten years from now and go, "Wow, I didn't even know myself then." What did you think? What do you th- when you look back? What do you think had gone wrong in your life up to that? It was so I used to. Um, well, the thing that I 
talk about to people was, I guess, more, I wanted to be an AFL player, which is Australia's biggest sort of um, national code here. A game I will never understand, yeah. no matter how many times people explain it to me. Yeah, yeah. It's the most manliest, manliest sport there is, and we all run right. around in short shorts and tackle each other, and <laughs> it's great. I have. Man. It's inches away from gay porn, yeah, but okay, go on. that's right. That's right, exactly right. Yeah, there's just a football in there, yeah. <laughs> which again is kind of... <laughs> it's not, it's not. Yeah. No, but look, it, w- it was just, um, I wanted to make AFL because then I would get all the girls and have all the money and have all the fame and... Um, to go by something you said. Again, this, your book has just really influenced the way I'm seeing the world this day and age. It's fantastic, mate. But it was I was chasing those extrinsically derived values, you know, and I had no sort of sense of, hey, you're actually quite good right now, just as a sort of personal sense of fulfillment. It was just a lot of ego, you know. Um, but I guess I really wanted to know, what. so what – Who's actually making this book? Are you actually receiving any sort of flack from it? And has there been a bit of controversy with it? Because like you said before, to me, it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I just, before I get to controversy, yeah, there's absolutely. A, a couple of things in what you said that are really interesting. So, yeah, I, a few things. Let me come back to psychedelics in absolutely. a minute. But the, absolutely. Which I keep thinking about as you're speaking, that this moment, uh, things really fell into place for me, right? Mm. I was doing this research and it had been very, you know, I really believed the simplistic biological story, right? Yeah. Uh, For all sorts of reasons that we can talk about, but, and I've been for a long time. Mm. And I remember I had this moment, I was learning all this stuff intellectually and I was thinking, okay, this is, fuck, I can see bits of this are true. And there was this moment, I was with this, I went to interview a South African psychiatrist called Derek Summerfield, he's a great guy. Mm. And we were, so Derek was in Cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants in that country. And to the people there, I mean, obviously, it, it, it available all over the world yep. before then. And uh, the local Cambodian doctors didn't know where they were. Mm. So Derek explained. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And he was like, well, what do you mean? He thought yeah. was good, they were going to talk about like herbal remedy, like Jinko Biloba or something. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who one day stood on a landmine and got his leg blown off. Uh, so they gave him an artificial limb. They're good at that in Cambodia. I've seen that myself. Uh, and it goes back to work in the fields. But apparently it's really fucking painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb, which I suppose makes sense. Yeah. Imagine it was pretty traumatic to go back in the place where you've been blown up. Absolutely. The guy starts to cry all day, refuses to get out of bed, classic depression. Yeah. Right? So they said to him, so we gave him an antidepressant. And Derek's like, well, what? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense, right? Mm. Exactly what we're talking about. Mm. Um, they figured if they bought him a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position that was fucking him up, right? Mm. So they bought him a cow. With a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression <coughs> was gone, right? And they said to Derek, so that cow, that was an antidepressant, right? Because if you've been raised to think about antidepressants the way we have, that sounds like yeah. a joke. Yeah. I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. He gave me a cow, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so I was taking... Ate well for a night, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what those Cambodian, and obviously for some people, then the solution will be more complex. But what, what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the World Health Organization has been trying to tell us for years, right? If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not crazy, you're not a machine with broken parts, mm. you're a human being with unmet needs, right? And it totally fits what you're saying about wanting to be an AFL player in a, in a different kind of way. Everyone knows they have natural, psycho- natural physical needs, right? Yeah. Obviously, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you mm. need clean air. If I took them away from you, you'd be fucked really quickly, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. It's equally strong evidence that human beings have natural uh, psychological needs, mm. right? You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. Mm. You need to feel that people see you and value you. Mm. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And and if you become, you know, if you become cut off from those things, you know, I'm really glad to be alive today. Our culture has lots of good things about it lots of good things mm. but we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for people mm. it's not the only thing that's going on but I think it's the reason why the crisis is increasing uh, and it's mm. been increasing you know, I'm 39 years old every year I've been alive depression and anxiety have increased and I think that totally relates to if you think about so often so sometimes some of the pushback I get is people will say this can't be... Right. If I had someone saying this to me the other, the other day, for someone I know and like, I've yeah. an Australian I've known for a long time, saying, this can't be right because I've got everything... He didn't put quite like this, but he said, I've got everything you need to be happy. I've got all this stuff you're talking about and I feel like shit, right? And I said, well, what have you got? It's interesting how he worded that. <laughs> I've got everything you would need. Exactly, that, yeah. that distance, everything that I've been told, yes. right? It's, it, that's implicit in what he said. Yeah. 
the, the, and I said, well, tell me what you've got that makes sense. He said, well, I've got a hot wife. <laughs> I've got, uh, you know, I earn whatever, how much money it was. Yeah. I forget. And I said, well, wait, wait, wait. Where did you get the idea that that is what you need? That's right. You know, it made me think. It makes me think about. Um, it was, I had a breakthrough when I was thinking about this for the book, where because I was asking lots of folks, what about people who have good lives? Mm. You know, and someone said to me, I tried to know who it was. Someone said to me, read, read feminist books from the fifties and sixties. Right. Mm-hmm. One of the things that happens in a lot of those books, like the Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan, is women in the fifties would go to their doctor and they say, doctor, there's something really fucking wrong with me. They would have said their nerves. They wouldn't have said fucking fifties either. Yeah, but they, yeah. So wrong with my nerves, right? Because they said the nerves, they're not their brain because people talked about it a bit differently. Yep. Um, but it's something wrong with my nerves because um, I've got everything I could possibly want. I've got a husband who doesn't beat me. I've got a washing machine. I've got two kids. I've got a car. <laughs> and I feel like shit, right? Oh, and what a lot of doctors said is, you're right. There's something wrong with your nerves. Here's a prescription for Valium. Here's a prescription for whatever. Valium, the best drug in the world. Yeah, that's right, yeah. But, Definitely uh, an endorsement. Exactly. <laughs> full endorsement. Uh, but, but now, if we could go back in time and talk to this woman, we'd say, well, look, you've got everything you could possibly want by the standards of the culture. Standards of the culture are just wrong. Mm. You need more than that. And I think about an AFL player, who I'm sure if we think about this crisis in lots of young men mm. particularly in australia the suicide rate for young men is off the scale right um these young men i think about this have you read much about this young guy in toronto who drove the car into these people like about three no, weeks ago no so he's part of this it's this devastatingly awful it, it, yeah he, he's part of they initially they thought he was like a jihadi he wasn't at all he's part of this movement called incels who call themselves like involuntary celibates. They're basically men who hate women and can't get laid. Jesus. Um, probably because they hate women. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. Uh, but, so I've been reading a little bit about them, not, right. not not much, but you think about this, this kind of, these kind of all sorts of things that have been happening with masculinity. You see, so you think about an AFL player would be like, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm not an Australian, obviously, yep. but a paragon of masculinity. That's right. right. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. And you think about, and I'm sure there are loads of, brilliant things about being an AFL player, mm. particularly if you love the game and you love the, you know, all of that. I'm not mm. dissing for a minute being an AFL player. Of course. But, but you think about so much of what we're craved to long for is the external stuff, mm. right? So I think about, and it reminds me to come back to psychedelics because it's really relevant to this as well, but yeah. I think about one of the hardest causes of depression and anxiety that I learned about Um. For the book, I talk about the nine causes in, the, in Lost Connections, but the, there were two I found really hard to work, but one of the hardest ones I found to learn, re- really hard to learn about, was this thing that I could talk about as disconnection from meaningful values, right? So, and, and it, it kind of, it, there was a kind of version, although mysteriously I was never asked to play in the AFL, but yeah, really? the kind of we version, which was the, equ- exactly, <laughs> as, uh, the lost part of my life. You too Australian, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the kind of my equivalent of trying to be an AFL player, right, yeah. which was, so everyone knows that junk food has taken over our values and uh, junk food has taken over our diets and made us mentally sick, physically mm-hmm. sick, right? So I said that wrong. Yeah. Everyone knows that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick. But one thing that's so interesting is that there's a kind of equivalent, learning the evidence, that a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. I learned about it from an amazing man called Professor Tim Kasser, who's shown that the more you think life is about how you look to other people, about money and status... Mm the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious by a really significant amount, right? That, that, um, and, and he's also shown that we have, as a culture, become much more driven by these junk values, mm. right? So just like, you know, like I was, I basically lived on KFC for 10 years. Uh, we've been living on a kind of KFC for the soul, right? Yeah, yeah. And you think about, I don't mean this is a cheap political point. I'm actually quite sympathetic to his followers, although I don't like him at all. Mm. Think about Donald Trump, right? Yep. So Donald Trump is someone who is totally driven by how by these external values, Absolutely. right? He lives in a golden tower with a wife he clearly doesn't like, but loves the external <laughs> appearance of. Yeah. Uh, he is the most powerful man in the world. He is the president of the United States. And he is the most miserable cunt you can ever imagine, mm. right? Think about mm. the aching unhappiness you see every time you hear him speak. Mm. Because he's been told the wrong story mm. of what it means to be happy. He's mm. looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Mm. And it's partly the places where a kind of particular vision of masculinity, actually not like, there are other visions of masculinity which I think are much healthier, like being a provider and, Mm. you know, all sorts of other things. But 
you think about the vision of masculinity he's been sold, literally saying, I can grab any woman I like by the pussy and she, she, I don't even care if she likes it, right? Yeah. It's the most kind of base kind of uh, particular kind of Just masculinity. Just like al- alpha and ego and yeah, all that stuff. Exactly right. Exactly. It's not a coincidence. He's the most powerful person in the world, mm. right? We've constructed this pyramid of values. There's this Indian philosopher, Krishnamurti, who said it's no sign of good health to be well adjusted to a sick society. And I remember reading that just after Trump won yeah. in the United States and thinking, fuck, a society trying to adjust itself to a value system that exalts Donald Trump is going to be a society that's depressed and anxious mm. and it should be depressed and anxious because that is not meeting our deeper needs. Do you see what I mean? Oh, absolutely. But so why are we not listening to that? Why do we have such an innate inability to not listen to what we're, like, our body is demanding of us? You know, every every, I mean, that classic understanding of you know, going to work nine to five and now, I mean, you read your first email at fucking whatever, 6 a.m. in the morning and then even even later at, at night and we are physically and psychologically miserable and yet we just keep doing it. How, why are we not listening to that? Because we're a conflict of all kinds of values, right? So if it was just that we were the better parts of ourselves, um, so mm. I think there's a, a kind of complex range of reasons. Professor Casser, the guy who did all this research on what I call junk values, mm. points out we are, we are immersed in a machine from the moment we're born that is designed to get us to neglect these insights. More 18-month-old children recognise the McDonald's M than know their own last name, right? <laughs> so you think about, yeah. from the moment we're born, you are told the way to make yourself feel better is to buy things, mm. to show them off. There's this little experiment that was done in 1978, not by Professor Casser, by someone else. Mm. It's a really simple experiment. Get a bunch of five-year-olds, you split them into two groups. First group is told so the first group is shown two adverts for I forget what it was but whatever the equivalent of Peppa Pig was in 1978 right some toy famous toy shown two adverts second group is shown no adverts and at the end of it they say to all the five year olds hey kids you've got a choice now you can either play with a nice boy over here who doesn't have that toy from the advert or you can play with a nasty boy who's got the toy right and the kids who haven't seen the adverts choose the nice boy (laughs) and the kids who have seen the adverts choose the cunt with the toy right and you think about as a culture, we are all being primed to make that second choice, Every right? Other. Think about there's this clip of Melania Trump in 2009, not to harp on about the Trumps, but yeah. and they're an extreme example, but it's a clip of Melania Trump in 2009 when she goes to speak at NYU in New York to the students. I can't imagine why, but anyway, and, and she's asked by one of the students, um, would you have married Donald Trump if he wasn't rich? And she says, do you think he would have married me if I wasn't beautiful? Wow. Think about what that reveals about their relationship, right? That means she knows if she gets fat, fucking over. That's right. He knows if he loses his status, it's over. You think about, that's a good illustration of how these junk values make us more depressed. Isn't it? That's going to create an insecure relationship, which is very different to, I'm guessing, Barack and Michelle Obama, whoever you think of their politics, and I'm much more sympathetic to them than Trump's, Mm -hmm. but I still have some criticism of them. Um, I'm sure would say, well, I'd love her even if she became obese and was burned in a fire and Mm. and she'd say, I'd love Barack even if he was homeless. You You can see how that would be a more secure relationship. Now, we've all become much more, I mean, we're not, Donald and Melania Trump are an extreme example, yep. but we, the culture has become much more like Melania and Donald Trump. Massively. Right? And, and those, those these insecurities that are run throughout the culture, mm. which are making us, fe- we, the, the construction of this machinery to make us feel this way, mm. an economy that's built around saying, you're not good enough unless you buy X. It's right? so true. So true. Every, every, I mean, just on your point, it's straight into my head. Every ad campaign you see, you know, it's like, I mean, I was just driving past um, a little billboard that said, um, celebrate Mother's Day in the right way, you know? And I saw that and I immediately was like, fuck, I want to get mum for something, you know, for something of Mother's Day. But then I was like, oh, hang on a second. Maybe it'd just be good if I just spent time with her. But even just seeing something like that, you know, made me feel a little bit shit just straight away, you know? And I mean, I remember a time, I mean, I came home from work and I was really, this stuff always really plays up when, you, when you're more buggered, you know, when you're more stressed because you're craving some sort of kick, you know, um, like a little bit of a cocaine bump to feel good or something. But I came home and, um, you know, dad had the TV on or something. It was some sort of like jingle, you know, advert jingle. And I was in the shower and then 20 seconds later, I was just singing the jingle. It's, it's, it's very, very scary how, how quickly this stuff just gets into your head, you know. And advertising is like the ultimate friend of me because it's saying, Tom... I think you're a really good bloke. Mm. I really like you. If only you didn't stink so much. Yeah. I mean, I might say it's coming your friend, right? Sure. You can see how these, 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 how that, how that, how that works. So, 
a, a big part of my book, Lost Connections, is about the solutions to this. And so if you think about junk values, which mm. I think is one of the harder things to solve in some ways, there's, there's kind of two prongs. One is we should much more tightly regulate advertising, mm. right? Just So I went to Sao Paulo in Brazil. They just banned outdoor advertising. Oh, really? Not allowed, right? Yep. Big increase in how people felt mentally. Just, just a lot of it, you should just get rid of it, right? No justification for yeah. it. Um, but the second one, which I think is more important, is dealing with the, well, not more important, but important in a different way, mm. is dealing with the internal stuff. So this is really fascinating. Tim Casser, who did all this research, was involved in this really interesting group where he... It's really simple. It's like a kind of Alcoholics Anonymous for consumerism, right? Mm. For junk values. So what they did is people would get together and a couple of times a week for like, I think it was four or five months, and they would just talk about, firstly, they would talk about what are the things you feel you've got to buy, right? And often with the teenagers, it'd be like Nike sneakers or whatever. Mm. And they go- Condoms. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Probably not, actually. (laughs) And they'd be like, yeah, not with these insult lads. And they'd be like- what do you think you'll get when you get these sneakers, right? And most of these kids were not like going to be Michael Jordan. It wasn't, they wanted to jump higher, yeah, right? Yeah. And most of them be like, well, I would feel accepted. I would feel I had status, right? Doesn't take long for the kid to identify that, to go, oh, wait a minute, right? Why have I been made to feel this mm. way? But so they would initially talk about the junk values and just giving people space to talk about it would quite quickly mean people take it apart themselves. Not mm. everyone, but most people go, well, why do I want this? Like yeah. you just said, why do I think the way to be nice to my mum on Mother's Day is to buy some piece of shit she's not going to value yeah. rather than like go and spend the whole day with her and yeah. take her around somewhere nice and go to the beach or whatever it would be. Buy right? something nice. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, or actually maybe I shouldn't just be nice to my mum on Mother's Day. That's maybe right. I should be nice to her the whole fucking year round, Very right? true. Uh, yes. But the, the, maybe the nice thing I could do for Mother's Day is say I'm going to once every three weeks take you out on a Thursday night or whatever. Yeah. You know? But you can see how that's not what we're told to think. But the, the, um, so partly it was about the deconstructing the junk values, but more importantly, it was about saying to people, well, what do you think is actually important in life, mm. right? What do you think matters? And people would talk about love, they would talk about meaningful work, they'd talk about all sorts of things. And the group would just meet and go, well, how, what could we do to integrate that more into our lives? And what was interesting is just that, that meeting a couple of times, um, couple of times, I think meeting every, four, every couple of weeks for months led to a really significant reduce in their junk va- reduction mm. in their, their junk values. And this is one of the things that to me is so interesting. These insights are just beneath the surface for everyone, right? Yeah. It's very rare you'd find a person, maybe Donald Trump, but you'd have to go to a very extreme person mm. who could hear this stuff and not be like, yeah. I mean, it's like the most banal right. cliche to say to people, you're not going to lie in your deathbed mm. about all the shit you bought. You're going to think about moments of meaning and connection in totally. your life, right? But it's about... But what's so interesting is to have... This is one of the nine causes of depression that I write about in Lost Connections, but... Think about how removed the conversation about depression is, the official conversation about depression Mm. is, from these insights, Mm. right? Think about the difference between what we've just been talking about Mm. and saying to someone, it's just a problem with your serotonin levels, which is what I was told. That's such a gap, right? And it's not to say there aren't real biological factors and we shouldn't deal with them, because absolutely we should. Um, And obviously I write about them in the book as well, but, Mm. but... this is not just a biological crisis. It's a social and spiritual crisis that has to be dealt with at every level. And you know what's really scary as well is the fact that even the concept of just having another pill involves, oh, just take this and then you'll be okay. So there's really no real... I mean, that sounds very similar to just, hey, buy this thing for Mother's Day and then your mum will be happy. Buy this thing for yourself and then you'll be happy, you know? It's very scary how how closely related those things are, you know? When well, it's, it's important to say because the, the pills do give some people some relief and have some of course, value. Of course, but but you're right; they're not solving the reasons why we're depressed and anxious no. for, the vast, for, the, for the vast majority of people, which is why we need a much broader understanding and a much broader set of solutions. Mm. Um, I think you're right, and it's not a coincidence. I kept thinking about. I spent a lot of time with these people, amazing people. One of the heroes in my book is this doctor called Sam Everington in East London. It's from a poor part of East London where I lived for a long time. Mm. And Sam was really uncomfortable. He's a GP. Had loads of people coming to him with depression, anxiety. Okay. It was really uncomfortable because, you know, like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants, but you could see they weren't solving the problem for most patients. Mm. You could see they were depressed for perfectly fucking understandable reasons. He he decided to pioneer this different approach. So one day, a woman came to him called Lisa Cunningham, who'd been shut away in her home, who I got to know quite well. She was cut away, shut away in her home with crippling depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to her, I'm going to keep prescribing you these drugs if you want, but I'm also going to prescribe something else. I'm going to prescribe you to take part in a group. 
there was an area behind the doctor's surgery. It was known as Dog Shit Alley, which tells you where it was. Yeah. It backs onto a park. Sam said to Lisa, don't worry. I'm going to carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also going to prescribe something else. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group, right? Mm. So he said, what I want you to do is turn up a couple of times a week with a group of other depressed and anxious people. I'll come and support you. And we're going to turn dog shit alley into something nice, right? First time they met, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety, right? Mm. But a few things happened. The first thing was she realized they had something to talk about that wasn't how shit they felt, right? Mm. They decided they were going to learn gardening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons, right? There's a lot of evidence exposure to the natural world is a really powerful antidepressant. Mm. Um, and the other thing that happened is they started to form a tribe. They started to form a group. They started to look after each other. They started to solve each other's problems. Mm. Um, the way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. Mm. There's a study in Norway of a very similar program found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for an obvious reason, right, it's dealing with the, some of the reasons why they felt so shit in the first place. Now you think about, mm. and I don't want to over explain it with reference to Big Pharma and the pharmaceutical companies, because lots of things are going on there, only one part of it. Yep. But as you were saying, what you were saying a minute ago, which I totally agree with, you know, there's a $10 billion industry to to tell Lisa her problem is just a problem in her brain. And there's a zero billion dollar industry in telling her, you know, you might be helped by going to a gardening program where you make friends, right? Mm. I mean, maybe not zero billion dollars, because maybe someone makes some money out gardening, but mm. it's very little money, mm. right? And, and you see, that, well, that, le you, that helps you to understand how we've ended up with such a distorted picture of the causes of depression. Mm. It's not the biological causes aren't real, they are. But how did it, how, it comes back to your question, how did, how did we, question you asked much earlier, which mm. is, how did we end up neglecting the thing that is so of the things that are so intuitively obvious to mm. us, right? It's partly because a separate story has been promoted to us for partly, not entirely, because a separate story has been promoted to us and, and, and there's a kind of machinery to get us to neglect these deeper these deeper causes. Do you know what? This is I'm I don't mean this to sound controversial, but I just wonder if this is maybe the reason why I mean f so when you said um you know, there's a there's a ten billion dollar industry for for the promotion of these things, you know, and that's in layman's terms. Um, and then there's a zero billion dollar. I I immediately put myself in this position where if I'm feeling so depressed, and I've I've had um, I haven't had a, a clinical bout of depression, but um, I've had you know moments where the anxiety was so bad for so long that I just felt depressed. I had feel like a sandbag on my head. But anyway, um, I feel like if I went to a doctor and they said, hey, you've got a serotonin balance, that would kind of counterintuitively make me feel special. So that then that's like a bit of an upper because like, oh, it's just a, it's, a, it's, it's I've got a serotonin in like, it, it would almost feel like a, a, a crutch to lean on. I feel like that kind of, I don't know. I just, when you're in that level of just deep, deep, deep darkness and sadness, you know, anything kind of feels like a kick. And if you say, hey, you're not like everybody else, you have a serotonin balance, like, oh, I am different. I am special. Like, I am this sort of thing, you know? And I just felt like that kind of played into this egotistical mindset that I may have taken in if I was in that element and I had been. I don't know that. Yeah. that I've not thought of it quite that way. I don't know that it's about specialness. I think it's about, as a culture, most people have been told one of two stories about depression. Either you're weak mm. and you need to man up, even if you're a woman. Yeah. Uh, or it's a biological, just a biological problem in your brain, right? And to me, I think of it kind of like an analogy. If you think about it in the 1870s, right? So you've had 2,000 years of gay people being persecuted. Mm. Then the 1870s, you have this, for the first time, you have people who self-identify, what we would call gay people now, they call themselves Uranians in Germany, mm. who start saying, well, I'm, I'm a Uranian, and they say, I'm not evil, I'm diseased, right? And you can see how, for that, that would have been liberating, right? Mm. I'd rather be diseased than evil. That's right. Now, I'm gay, if I said to you, I'm diseased, you'd mm. be like, mate, yeah. why are you made to feel this way, I've right? Feel, actually. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you could, you know, you can see how... Uh, that would have been initially a relief, but yeah. over time we realised, well, actually, neither of these options are true. Gay people Absolutely. are neither evil nor diseased. Mm. Uh, yeah, you don't tell a story about gay people, but the, the, in a similar way with depression, what I say to people is, that choice you've been told, either you're weak or you've got a bio just a biological illness, you're neither of those things, mm. right? There's a stress again, there's a real biological component, but actually, mostly, you're a person with unmet needs, mm. right? Mm. And to me, that that's such more liberating because it says to people your pain makes sense yeah. right that, that you're not you know I remember having this moment because I used to say this thing about biology so 
frees people from stigma to be told it's a biological problem. Mm. I was interviewing this brilliant guy called Professor Mark Lewis, who's an uh, excellent neuroscientist, and I was arguing with him about this, and I said, oh, but this, won't, won't this, you know, because he says, you know, we shouldn't think about it just in biological terms. I was saying, but won't this mean there's more stigma? He said to me, Johan, no one ever doubted that leprosy and AIDS were biological problems, right? Mm. You might have noticed yeah. there was a bit of stigma about those yeah. two. Right? And I suddenly thought, oh, yeah. And actually, there's a lot of evidence I go through in the book that actually the best way to reduce stigma is to talk about how it makes sense. Not mm. least because if, if depressed people are just biologically broken, they're like a subspecies, mm. right? They're just like subspecies of different people who are just not like us. Mm -hmm. But actually, the truth is they're more like canaries in the coal mine, mm. right? Because actually, the, if you think about the nine factors that cause depression and anxiety that I wrote about in Lost Connections, you know, those factors are making some people depressed and anxious, but they're making most people in the society less happy and satisfied than they could be, yeah. right? Uh, and the solutions that I go through, if we implement them, they're going to reduce really significantly reduce depression and anxiety, but they're also going to reduce just much wider unhappiness. Yeah. And actually what this does is it unites all of us in a common fight rather than asking you to kind of feel pity for a minority. Do you know mm, what I mean? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I mean, if you're, if we're going over these things, it's like there's a stigma involved. The majority of people sound to me, you know, without knowing the facts that like they're pretty unhappy, you know? So it, I mean, a stigma just kind of, Yes, there's a stigma, but it's like the majority of people. So if we all understand these things, you know, the stigma is going to go away because everyone's going to put their hand up and be like, oh, fuck, this is actually helping me a lot. You know, mm -hmm. it's fascinating. I think that's true. And that comes back to what we're saying about, there's a component of this in relation to saying, I know you're really interested in as well, which is this, this debate about psychedelics. Yeah. It's really interesting in this because, well, for lots of reasons, but some, some listeners might not know that there was a lot of research until the mid 1960s, there was a lot of research giving at that time LSD to people with like alcohol addiction problems, um, like depression mm. and these studies weren't done to the standards we would want them to be done now but they had very promising early results and then Nixon comes in the whole thing gets shut down yeah. and in the last um, eight years there's been a real reawakening of this research so I went to interview the scientists and some of the people taking part in this research by all over the world from like um, UCLA in Los Angeles in, in NYU in New York in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore in Sao Paulo in Brazil and uh, Oslo in Norway and somewhere else oh yeah in London where I'm from oh, yeah. And there are loads of fascinating bits of research, but I think it totally relates to, I'm interested to hear about your experiences with this as well. Mm. So there are so many interesting things about this. And it totally relates to what we're saying that, but there's one little sub finding that to me was the most striking bit for me, right? So they did this research at Johns Hopkins on smoking. So what they did, Johns Hopkins is one of the most prestigious universities in the world. The guy who led this experiment, Professor Roland Griffiths is one of the most prestigious scientists in the world. And actually, I think he only got permission. He was the first person to get permission to do his research. Mm. And a lot of people who know him think he only got permission because they assumed he was going to say these are really evil drugs. And uh, they, do you know I what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's cause, worked cause, well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, it led to this complete reawakening. Yeah, but yeah. this wasn't the first experiment <laughs> he did, but it, was the, it wasn't the one that opened the door, but this was a bit further down the line. But mm. um, what they did is they took chronic long-term smokers, right? Mm -hmm. People who've been smoking for more than 20 years and have tried to stop in all sorts of ways. I thought about this a lot because my mum is a chronic chain smoker there's an incredible photo of me and my mother when i'm six months old she's breastfeeding me smoking and resting the ashtray on my stomach oh. right and when i found this photo recently she she said to me um you were a difficult baby i needed that cigarette you cunt yeah, but, uh, yeah but, uh, i was holding your ashtray you sorry, sorry. <laughs> but um but so they look at people like my mum what they did is they gave them three doses of psilocybin the active component in magic mushrooms over, I think it was six months, so separated by every two months. Okay. Um, and what happened was mind-blowing. 80% mm. of them stopped smoking and were still non-smokers a year later. 80%, right? It's insane. It's, to give you a comparison, the next most successful smoking cessation tool, which is uh, nicotine patches, has a 17%. Success rate, <laughs> one 7%, right? Isn't that ridiculous? So they're like, what the fuck? This yeah. is the, anyway, they did lots of other research, but... There's a little sub-finding of this research that I think is so interesting. So what they found was when people take psychedelics, they generally have something akin to a spiritual experience. Yep. Right? I say this as an atheist, I don't mean it as a yep. mystical exp uh, experience of God or anything. For sure. But the, 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 so they generally feel radical, the kind of collapse in the sense of ego. Mm. Like you said, mm. in your own experience, ego death, uh, 
a profound sense of connection to the world around them. Um, but what's interesting is, so there's a range of responses. So some people have an incredibly intense spiritual experience, and some people, a minority, have no spiritual experience at all. And what they found in this Johns Hopkins research was the positive effects, like stopping smoking or reduction in depression, correlate extremely closely with the intensity of the spiritual experience, right? So the people who had a really intense spiritual experience have loads of benefits. Mm. People who don't have a spiritual experience but have taken the drug don't have any benefits, right? So it's not like what the drug does is it flips a chemical switch in your no. brain and cure. We don't want to talk about it the way, the simplistic way people used to talk about chemical antidepressants in the 90s. Yep. What it is, is one of the, what's his name? One of the people who did the research in the 60s on psychedelics who I interviewed, fuck his name will come back to me in a minute, said to me, what it is, is a learning experience, right? What it is, is the psychedelics give you a, an ex a taste of what it can be like to feel deeply connected. Mm. Now, most people, for perfectly good reasons, mm. are not going to want to take psychedelics very often, right? Yep. So, in a way, what, what that does is it gives us a way... It, it, to me, it's almost like it points a direction in a compass, right? That it shows you the direction in which you want to travel to change your wider life. I remember speaking to... They did this big trial where they gave psilocybin to what are called treatment-resistant depressed people, so people with really bad depression who weren't being helped by anything. Totally in London at UCL. And the guy who led that study, Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris, is a great guy. And him giving me an example. There was a woman, goes on the depression uh, the program, been really depressed for a long time. Mm. They give her these psychedelics, gives her massive relief from depression. She has a sense of deep connection. And then she goes back to her job in some seaside town in Britain, office job, and she's, you just can't walk around her office thinking, well, we're all deeply connected, we're all equal, the natural world is so important. Yeah. You can't work in, a, in that office and think like that mm. because you won't be working in that office very long if you do, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. That the way we live, for many people, militates against living in a way that's compatible with the insights that are received during the psychedelic experience. Yeah. Now, to me, what that does is it tells us we've got to change the way we live, right? It's yet more evidence from all the evidence that I write about in, in Lost Connections about why we're being made to feel this way. So that's just, it fits into this. I wouldn't want to take the psychedelic evidence on its own, although I think it's important and valuable. Sure. But in the part of this wide, and it also tells us, you know, a lot of people are not going to want to take psychedelics anyway for all Absolutely. sorts of reasons. Yep. The, but it tells us these are insights that are so important for even people who don't want to use psychedelics about the direction in which we need to travel. Does that fit with your experience, oh, Tom? Massively. Do you know what? I'm, I'm very interested because obviously I have some sort of anecdotal testament to this as well. But when, when did they... Um, Retest. So you said there was eighty percent reduction in in people that were. So they stopped smoking completely. Eighty percent of them. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. So when did they actually test them again? Like was it straight away after they took the drugs, or was it? So they do a follow up at two months. I think if I remember rightly, it's in the book. Two months, six months, a year, eighteen months. They're still doing the follow up. Okay. Right. So yep. I interviewed some people who've been in that program in mm. Baltimore, and it was fascinating because one of the guys, his name is Mark. I he asked me not to use his surname. Although he subsequently has written publicly about it, but I better not use the Senate. Yeah, sure. This guy, Mark, who's so interesting. Mark was a social worker who's quite depressed. He tried antidepressants to stop them because they hadn't done anything for him. Mm. And um, he, I think a lot about Mark, he, he'd had all this anxiety, a lot of social anxiety. When he was 10, his dad had a heart attack and he, came back home it was very unwell and then he had another heart attack at home and and Mark remembers he was 10 his dad being taken into the ambulance and thinking I'll never see him again and he didn't ever see him again and his mum was so depressed and so distraught she didn't never really told him what had happened or and he said from then on he'd, he'd had this terrible sense of grief and anxiety and then we got to be I think he was 45 and he sees this advert that says you know I think it said, had you had depression? We're doing this trial. So he signs up and he, he knew nothing about psychedelics. In fact, the only thing he knew about psychedelics was when he was a teenager at, at church. They used to have, he'd seen a comic strip where people, someone took LSD, thought their face was peeling off oh, and no. had to be shut away in a psychiatric hospital for the rest oh, of their life. Man. But that's what, you know how it is. Yeah. Uh, so that's what he thought psychedelics were, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he suddenly did not expect to be taking face them in the melted. middle of, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He did not expect to be taking them in the middle of the most prestigious academic university Absolutely. The, in the world. Um, so he, d he does this trial and he describes the experience and I remember Mark talking about he the first time he, he takes the psilocybin 
in this lab that's made to look like a kind of living room. I've been there in, in, in Johns Hopkins. He has this, this vision that he's in this huge lake and, and he sees this kind of fawn, a deer, and he follows it up a waterfall. At the top of this waterfall, his, his dad is there waiting for him. And, and his dad says to him, you know, I'm really sorry that I had to leave you. I didn't want to do that. I'm really sorry. Um, and then his dad says to him, um, you know, you don't have to be afraid of the world. And he reaches into Mark and he pulls out all these walls and he says, I want to I wanna thank these walls because you've kept my son safe when I couldn't. Um, but you don't need these anymore. You don't need the, the walls. We can thank them and we can let them go. Mm. And Mark describes, you know, coming, coming around from this experience and his girlfriend coming to pick him up and her saying, what, what was it like? And him just not having the words to describe it. And as the months and years go by, because it's a good few years since Mark took part in this trial now, how that made it possible for him to then change his life, right? He, he then realised he had to integrate these insights into his life and he started meditating and so on and, and actually learning very deep meditation. He now teaches meditation, funny enough. Wow, well, um, wow. Well. Yeah, yeah, he, he runs a course teaching meditation. He's a, he's a wonderful person. Wow. Well. The, 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 uh, but it was really interesting. I spoke to quite a lot of the people who'd taken part of these psilocybin trials in Johns Hopkins and it was interesting because they were all people... They deliberately looked for people, well, you had to be psychedelic naive, so you had to have not taken them before. Cool. And they deliberately looked for kind of what would be called middle class respectable people who wouldn't yeah. be the kind of people you would expect to yeah. take psychedelics. And it was really interesting going and meeting these kind of middle class or some, some quite posh, you know, Maryland people and them just talking in this extraordinary way about psychedelics. This was true of the people who took part in the trials in in Los Angeles as well um, where I interviewed people who'd taken part in them it was just and and to me that was so so profound and I saw this in so many places people who had been acutely depressed who weren't by exploring these different ways of thinking about depression that are in line with the best it's not about this is really good science what these mm. people are doing it's not but it's interesting what often not in every case but a lot of the time what the science is doing is vindicating what, what is more traditionally seen as kind of more hippie-ish insight about um, you know who we are as human beings and what we need as human beings mm. you know mm. I always um, try to make sure that I you know try to speak about as little as myself on this but I have to give you um some, you know, some, uh, yeah, I'm interested, a taste yeah. of the experience that I had. So I, the first time I ever did mushrooms, um, I was just with a mate after school. I was a pretty sort of innocent kid. Um, probably looking back with hindsight, I had, um, you know, lots of, uh, experiences and bouts with anxiety and stuff. I think, you know, puberty was a pretty scary time for me and, um, just didn't know what was going on. And, um, it was all these things, but I, I was not aware of it and I, it definitely wasn't impacting my life to the extent where I needed any sort of significant help. Um, but, um, I had these mushrooms. My mate had them in a little bit of honey. And um, we went down. It was a shitty, shitty, out, like real bad day. And it was just um, raining and pouring. We went down to the to this underpass of a freeway and um, I kind of just laid on the ground there. And he was just kind of watching his hands. It was a really very nice setting. And about half an hour had gone by and I started seeing like these vibrations in the top of the, up to the, top of the underpass. And they were, they were, never, they were never really, um, you know, like hallucinations or anything. I mean, I wouldn't describe them like that, but it was just kind of, um, I would see movement patterns and then my imaginative mind would take that away. And I remember sort of just seeing squirrels and things and all that sort of stuff. But I would look at the grass and I would look at the, the flowers and they were just so, so beautiful. And I really felt, even at the time I'd come to this sort of epiphany that I was never really seeing nature without my ego wall in, you know, um, there to, to mm. put some sort of. I don't know, internal experience or external ex experience or what someone said about it and all this, you know, I was seeing it just for what it really was and the colour was a lot greener. I remember um, walking over the top of the freeway on the overpass and having a look at the, the green through the middle and thinking, God, if I, if I, if I wasn't tripping, if, if I didn't know I was tripping right now, I'd probably just jump because that looks like the most fluffiest grass I've ever seen. And it was like this beautiful, not like, oh, I'm really fucking depressed. It was like, hey, I just want to be a part of this, this grass, you know, but... I did shrooms on and off for a good couple of years 
And then I had this experience on schoolies where the set and setting was off and, and all this sort of thing. Um, and it was a harrowing experience. It was um, my mate and I kind of figured it out. And it was, um, we probably reckon we had about 12 grams or something up into that area. And we didn't mean to. It was just a very potent dose. And um, it was terrible straight from the outset. Huge panic attacks. Um, he was trying to vomit it up. I was getting ready to call the ambulance. And he was like, dude, like threw the phone out of my hand. It was like, Moon, we're just tripping. You just got to wait it out. And my letting go muscle was like so weak back then. You know, I had all these things, you know, once I make the AFL, you know, then I'll get all this. And um, I would lie a lot because I was dishonest with myself and dishonest with the people around me and, and all these things. And so when I was taken into that that dungeon of like, hey, there's nothing protecting you. You've got no wall protecting you from the reality of the world. I was freaking the fuck out. And everything I would see was really, really scary. And I remember I tried to like sleep it off. And I, I remember... I was falling down this kind of, I called it Tron World. So have you seen the, the remake of the movie yeah, Tron? Yeah, yeah. You know, when he goes down the grid? Yeah, yeah. So I would picture myself falling and I was just falling for like an, an eternity. And the very end, I hit the, the bottom of a ground of like this desolate sort of landscape. And I just remember like looking up and it was really interesting that you said before about how Mark saw his father. But I was looking up and I saw my mum and my mum was just doing this to me the whole time she was doing that the whole time and I remember I was like behind these bars my mum was just so disappointed in me you know my mum listens to the show actually so <laughs> I love you very much mum <laughs> she's going to reveal to you that she was actually standing there she was following you around that day right, That's right. that yeah, was no hallucination time <laughs> yeah. right there so that was they were actually just shiitake mushrooms you know <laughs> but um, <laughs> they were fine um, you know but she was she was doing this to me like really aggressively and it's only with now um, actually with a few MDMA experiences and meditating a lot more that I see back at that moment. And it wasn't actually, because I took it initially as a, um, oh, you know, mum's so disappointed in me and I'm taking drugs and I'm like, you know, trying to chase girls up at schoolies, which is like an end of year 12 party and I'm doing all these things. But she wasn't disappointed me in, well, I guess what my subconscious was telling me, she wasn't disappointed in the fact that I was doing all these things. She was disappointed maybe in the sense that I wasn't living life to my authentic, authentic self. And the reason why I really wanted to know um, where, when you, when they retested the, the smokers who'd come across this, because that experience, um, s augmented my anxiety levels to the point of panic for years and years and years. I had panic attacks and high anxiety for up until literally about a year ago. Um, but it unraveled all these things in my life that I guess I had to start to deal with. And now I can look back on it and go, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, but it definitely was by no means a, an immediate change. You know, it was something that I really had to work on. But it was just how fascinating. How that's so interesting because that's that that that's one of the. There's a kind of sub finding in all of this research about what we call bad trips. Yeah. Which, which are really interesting, and so about twenty five percent of people have some aspect of negative response. Right. In these clinical trials, and these clinical trials are designed to maximise the positive response. So oh. that's quite high, right? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, so this doesn't mean twenty five percent have a consistently terrible experience, but yeah. it means have at least some moments of panic or discomfort. And part of that, so there's lots of things that were said about bad trips that turned out not to be kind of myths, like in the sixties, they said people would stare at the sun until they went blind. I think that was not true. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff about bad trips that is true, which I think is really interesting and worth thinking about. I think exactly in relation to your experience, which is partly, this is why I couldn't meditate for a long time. Mm. The experience of lowering your ego is not an unequivocally positive experience. Mm particularly if you are very defended against the world, right? We have ego walls for a reason, right? Think about Mark. Mark builds up these ego walls to protect himself because he's got a father who died, he's got a mother who's really depressed and can't look after him, and he has to defend himself from the world, right? And, and one of the interesting things about psychedelics is you see people... When you look at people in that situation, you see why we have egos, right? Mm. You need an ego, mm. right? An individual in the throes of a psychedelic experience is pretty defenseless. You wouldn't just leave them on their own, no right? No way. So you need an ego. I mean, you can see you need ego walls that are strong enough to protect you. Like if you look at little babies, little babies will often punch themselves in the accidentally punch themselves and cry because they don't yet know the bodies of their just little babies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> they don't. They don't yet know the limits of the self, right? The physical limits of the self or even the psychological limits of the self that know they're a different thing to their mother, for example. 
uh, but over time you develop that sense of ego, which you need, right? Mm. So that's why I'm not hitting myself in the face, even as I wave my hands back in a slightly annoying way. Mm. Um, in a similar way, you need a psych- psychological boundaries, but there's a danger they become so thick that you end up being isolating yourself and being cut off from the world. And, and, and what psychedelics can do when they're done right is help you have a more healthy relationship with ego. But to prematurely lower your ego walls or to lower your ego walls um, when you're not ready or you don't want to, mm. is really frightening. Oh. Right? You've got to be ready for a different relationship with ego. You've got to want it, right? So you can imagine, to go back to Trump, Trump, I'm certain, would have a horrendous experience on psychedelics because everything about him is about ego and defendedness against the world and defendedness against his own pain. He He was once asked in an interview if he would ever go and see a therapist and he said, no, I I wouldn't want to know what they'd find, right? And you think that's such a revealing thing to say Mm. to, to not, to not want to be connected to your own pain. So mm. you can see he deals with this in all sorts of ways. There's a line James Baldwin, one of my famous writers, said about uh, kind of, I think he was talking about racists, but he said, you know, the reason they're so angry is if they weren't angry, they'd have to feel their pain, right? And you can see that with someone mm. like Trump. The rage is a way of defending himself against deep pain. Right? Massively. Um, and, you know, it's not a coincidence, for example, his younger brother, Fred Trump Jr., mm. Uh, drank himself to death when he was in his 30s, you know, died of in his 30s of liver failure, not alcohol poisoning. Liver failure is quite hard to Man. be. And you can see how the same childhood Did well. in the same environment would produce <laughs> yeah. someone who would do that and someone who would go on to become Donald Trump, right? The, the and Not to make too narrow a point about him, but you can see that thing about ego, the relationship with ego and the relationship with... Um, lowering of ego. So why do you think that experience was so positive for you, Tom, given that it was an unpleasant experience? Well, it, it, it taught me that I needed to work on myself, I feel. Right, it, right. it was a big, so, and look, I mean, I haven't changed, you know, I haven't changed a whole lot. I've just become very, very confident with who I am as an individual. I think I've just um, really become um, cool with, like, how shit I am and so many things. And it's just been very empowering for me, you know? Um, and it's just, it's interesting to think, I often think about the people that are really suffering in the world and, you know, and this is, again, that's sort of self-centeredness of what anxiety can do because it's very, by definition, it's a self-centered emotion, you know, but um, like, oh, you shouldn't be feeling anxious and depressed. You've got it fucking good. You know, like your parents are good. Like you, you went to a great private school and, and all these things, you know, but again, it was that real disconnect or what I perceived to be expectation of what I should have in the world as opposed to where I was currently at. And I found that for whatever reason, you know, um, I can't think of any specific um, experience. I can remember anxiety as a kid, but I can't think of any specific experience that made me think, oh, fuck, I'm not good enough and I, I, I'm I, sucking really badly, you know, because I could never even admit that to myself, you know, let alone anyone else. And that's probably where the, uh, you know, the, the, the white lies and things came in as well. But, um, the, the mushrooms experience was so good for me um, and it works differently with um, because then I went down a, a road of dabbling with, with party drugs with speed and cocaine and doing some MDMA and, and things like that. Um, and now I'm probably in a way where I would get rid of the party drugs and I'd only start to do these every now and then as a, as a, as a way to self-reflect. Um, I've been thinking about doing some sort of um, microdosing and MDMA and meditation through that just to you know, well, constantly stay in tune with myself because meditation's good, but it's not. Um, I, I I don't know. I just have a calling for it. But fundamentally, it was it was a way for me to go. Well, something's not going right. Maybe you've got to look at another path. And then there was tons of other things in terms of seeing a psychologist and all that sort of stuff. But it was, you know, I I didn't plan for it. I definitely didn't plan for it. So I'm. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I would have um, turned out. Maybe I would have turned out really well. Um, that's just kind of what happened. You know. Yeah. That's so interesting because there was this one of the people at Johns Hopkins who also my jet lag brain is not retrieving the name of. Mm. So one of the academics there will come to me in a second. He he had this really interesting he said one of the roles of psychedelics and meditation is to break our addiction to ourselves, which I thought was a really interesting way of putting it. Mm. Break our addiction to the self. Mm. He said that was the thing. And this is one of the interesting things. He did this really interesting research with um deep meditators. And they give deep meditators psychedelics. And what they found was 
it's much less of a leap for deep meditators, the psychedelic experience, than it is for people who've never meditated. Right? Mm. That what the deep meditators would often say, and these are really deep meditators, people who've been meditating for 30, you know, 20 years, had gone on months-long retreats, that oh, kind of well, thing. They, so really hardcore. Yeah, they're killing it. Yep. And they often said that what psychedelics resembled was something something that they would get at the peak of meditation, right? But there's something about these two techniques that is very similar. Bill mm -hmm. Richards, one of the academics at uh, Johns Hopkins, said to me, if meditation is the beginner's slope on the ski slope, psychedelics are like the fucking Olympic... Uh, yeah. uh, Olympic um, Whatever that thing it, is. Uh, yeah, Olympic ski. <laughs> I should know about this because my dad's from a ski place but yeah, uh, yeah. in the Swiss mountains. But uh, <laughs> my dad used to ski to school. But the, um, Did he really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, we'll get mountain. on to that in a second. Yeah, yeah, a little mountain <laughs> in Switzerland. Yeah. But, um, Whilst taking mushrooms. <laughs> exactly, well, no. My dad, uh, my dad would benefit from it but wouldn't do it. I don't know. I wonder if my dad would do it. But anyway, the... Um, yeah. the, the you know, the, yeah, so you can see this relationship to psychedelics and, and, and meditation, I think, is a really interesting one. Massively, yeah. And, and really important. And this is what a, a lot of the people who did the program at Johns Hopkins then went on to, uh, it was, re I think, almost everyone I spoke to told about the program then learned a program meditation. It mm. inspired them to do that. Most mm. of them were kind of people who wouldn't, and most of them were people who wouldn't even go and buy illegal psychedelics. No. They were quite kind of law abiding. So, but you, so you're you're a meditator now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you is that an everyday thing? No, no. Yep. I need to go back to. I'm about to do this mad thing where um, I'm going away for for uh, I, I've booked this this beach house in in the US and I'm I'm gonna have three months where I have no internet and no smartphone. Oh, dude. Oh, I know. People, my. It's funny. People are either reacting with a mixture of envy or absolute horror and fear yeah, for me, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, uh, so anyway, I'm gonna so I'm gonna do it every day while I'm there. I'm gonna start because I've been got, got a bit. I've gotten a bit physically unhealthy because I've just been uh, just doing a bit promotional around the world. Mm. So you just can't really. Oh, you can't do anything. But the the um, so I'm gonna. I've got a yoga teacher and a Pilates teacher. I'm gonna fucking. Man, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So, but the so I'm gonna start doing it again then. But the particular yeah. kind of meditation that interested me is this meditation that's talked to by my friend Rachel Schubert, um, who's a kind of meditation coach in the US. It's called loving kindness meditation. It's really interesting because I think sometimes the way meditation is talked about, you know something's gone wrong with meditation when Rupert Murdoch is telling you on Twitter that he started doing it, right? Yeah, that's right. It's like, wait, well, yeah. something's gone wrong in this debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very Just often, <laughs> exactly, and very, exactly, well, someone, actually, some, there's a school of people within meditation who refer to the simplistic way meditation is talked about by some people as the meditation pill, mm. which is this idea that <laughs> What you need is meditation will make you a better little busy worker bee, right? Like that meditation is about saying, you, separating the tools from the spiritual insights, separating the tool from the spiritual insights mm. of Buddhism or the wider Eastern tradition, and just saying, oh, you feel fuzzy headed because you're doing this pointless, stressful job. Yeah. Well, just do this tool and then you'll be even more efficient at your yeah. pointless, stressful job. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And, and that is not, I think, a useful way of thinking about meditation. No, right? no, no. The, I mean, I'm not against it. If some people want to do it, of course, do whatever you want to do. But the, that, to me, is not the value of the insight. The For value sure. of the insight is the deeper, the deeper questions. Um, and, and so loving kindness meditation is a particularly interesting kind of meditation that really helped me. And it relates to how we get out of this machine that we were talking about in terms of advertising and so on. Mm. So... I noticed, I remember talking to my friend Rachel who taught me this, I was feeling a lot of envy. Uh, and I don't like feeling envy, well, no one likes feeling envy, it's a horrible feeling. No. Carrie Fisher said this great, uh, you know, who played Princess Leia, yeah, yeah. Said yep. this, who sadly died recently, she said this great line, um, envy is like drinking a cup of poison and waiting for the other person to die, which is <laughs> totally brilliant, it just corrodes it's you. It's spot on. Doesn't harm the other person, corrodes you. Yeah. So it's massively, massively helped me in reducing feelings of envy. The what what the way it works is loving kindness meditation. So you start and you picture somebody you love, and you picture something good happening for them, and you try to feel the joy and happiness you would feel for them. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't take a lot of effort. Yeah. Then you picture someone you like but don't love. You try to picture something nice happening for them, and you try to feel joy for them, right? Again, it's not that hard. Then you picture someone you really don't know very well. So, so I pictured um, there's a Donald Trump. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, well, could for, you do a uh, Ronnie Carson? Well, this comes actually. We can come to this. This is a good example. <laughs> yeah. I haven't done it with Trump, but you could do. So that, I, I picture there's a 
uh, when I'm in London, which is about half the year, I, uh, I live on a street where there's a little shop at the end of it. And there's a guy who works in the shop there who's perfectly pleasant. I smile at him. He smiles at me. I don't know his name. I probably never know his name. I picture him, right? Yes, yeah, right. I picture something nice happening for him. I try to feel joy for him. Again, it's, I can do it. It's, mm. And then you picture someone you slightly dislike. And you try to picture something nice happening for them and you try to genuinely feel joy for them. Mm. And then you picture this where Trump could come and then you picture <laughs> someone you really don't like, someone you really dislike as a person. Yeah. Or someone you really envy. I don't envy Trump but, at all. But mm. the, um, and then you try to picture something good happening for them and you try to imagine feeling happy for them, mm. right? And try to feel joy for them. And there's interesting research on this, this, this technique, sympathetic joy and loving kindness meditation, to show that they, over time they, re- they do reduce envy and they do actually reduce what are called pro-social behaviours like helping people. Mm. Um, and they reduce, which we know from wider evidence, reduces depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's the technique of meditation. The stuff that's just about hearing your thought, I can't do that. Yeah. I just, I'm too, yeah, I grew up in a quite violent environment. Uh, my way of coping with that kind of violence and aggression uh, and madness was to be constantly mentally active. Yeah. So to me, to say clear your head actually pre- increases depression and of anxiety. Course. It's awful. I don't like that. But the stuff that has a positive content, mm. um, that does help. You know, uh, so that stuff like loving kindness meditation. So yeah, I do that. You know, I used to have a very stressful, manic job where I was constantly kind of broadcasting, constant social media. It's a fucking recipe. Well, now, yeah, yeah. recently in London, I bumped into someone I, I knew back then who's a kind of social media star and a nice person. Cannot imagine more fucking miserable, oh, haunted, broken kind of person. Just kind of ma- manically jabbering about fucking nonsense on social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just kind of, you know, so ego aggravated. It's like... Ego itching powder, you yeah. know, that stuff. You th- feels like people are talking about you all the time. Oh, man, Some I people are saying it. you're amazing. Some people are saying you're a cunt. You're yeah, that, that's right. Do you know what I mean? That kind of... Um, so it's too much. It, it's uh, awful. So I used to have a It's inevitable that someone's going to have some yeah. sort of a breakdown from that. You can't not sure. Well, I, I, do, I wouldn't be able to cope with it. So. Well, it makes you... <laughs> fucked. <laughs> yeah, it, fu- it fucks I think that's up. a scientific term. Yeah, we'll, that we'll is, that's the clinical, yeah. 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 And yeah. I believe if you look at the Journal of Fucked Studies, yeah, that's, right. that's, yeah. that's yeah, yeah, they've got a lot of scientific it's in articles about uh, that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, they're totally the, the... So I used to have a very manic, quite ego-driven life. Mm. Um, and I've certainly still got plenty of <laughs> ego and not all the healthy kind now. But, you know, I moved to having a life that's much more connected to things I find meaningful, where I spend much more time with people I love, just listening to them, being present with them. Um, and it's important to say, I didn't write lost, very carefully didn't write lost connections as a kind of, well, dear reader, I did this and you yes. can too. Partly because I think that's an, actually an insult to all the people in our culture who don't have very much margin to change at the moment. For example, one of my closest relatives, struggling single mum, works every hour she can to pay the rent, gets home and fucking collapses, right? Yeah. Saying to her, your job now is to do loving kindness yeah, meditation, to democratise right. your workplace, to, you know, uh, <laughs> join a gardening programme, fight mushroom. for a universal <laughs> basic income, would be just a fucking yeah, insult to of her, course. right? So a big part of Lost Connections is about how we change our society and culture so we could free up people like totally. her to make the changes she wants to. It's really important. It's not about saying to individuals, the job is on you. Mm to fix this. And it was one of the interesting things in the conversation I had with Joe Rogan, mm. who I really liked as a person, mm. where for a while we were kind of circling around this because, and it's not that he's wrong. I think Joe's right. Joe is someone who's temperamentally minded with any individual to say, listen, there's something you can do, right? Mm. And that is totally important and true. Mm. And even if you're in prison mm. for the rest of your life and you'll never get out, there's some things you can do, right? So I agree with him. Even if you're tetraplegic, and you, you know, there's some things you can do, yeah, but, for sure. but, and there's some people who are more temperamentally mad like me to go, well, let's change the wider context. And of course you need both, right? Mm-hmm. There's individual responsibility, there's social responsibility, of course. all these things. Um, but it was interesting because for a while we were kind of circling around each other, yeah. which was part, I think was a problem on my part of communicating it, which is about saying, talking about social causes is not refuting individual responsibility. Mm. It's just that we need to talk about all these things and the individual has res- can exercise their responsibility in a context, mm. right? In a social context, mm. in, a, in an environment that the individual can't be separated mm. from the environment. Um, there, there's no such thing as an individual separated from the environment. We are a social mm. species. We are, you know, I mean, maybe if you're shipwrecked on an island and you're the lonely person there, but that's virtually never happens, right? It's not what we're talking about with mm. 99.9999% of people, more than that. Um, 
Just to, this is a really interesting point that I want to discuss. That's actually one of the questions that I was mm. thinking, um, asking you, because we there there are certain things that make us feel shit based on the societal societal circumstances and all these sort of things. And then you have these people, and this kind of gets into the more spiritual aspect of how do we make ourselves feel better in a world that's whatever distracted and yada yada yada. And you know we've heard for centuries. I mean, there are, there are Tibetan monks that live in caves their whole life. There's a lady, a, a blog I just read. And, she was just craving this this feeling of wanting to go so deep within her mind that she lived in complete solitude in the cave for 10 years, you know? I, I'm wondering, how do you... I just would love to hear your thoughts on that um, that intertwining, I guess, need that we all must do, maybe to, to take on some personal responsibility, to see the world in a much easier way to deal with, but then also do some other things. Because there's there's a lot of biological things that pertains to us needing to be a social species and one of the most beautiful things that I, I used to have a, a huge fear of public speaking now um, as a mental health advocate, I obviously try to do that a fair bit. Um, but one of the biggest reasons why we all innately cr- like just fear public speaking is because you're, you're stepping away from your, your social community and, and you're like, hey, like you're putting yourself out there for rejection. And rejection obviously back in the, in the primitive times meant um, rejection from the crew mm-hmm. and then increased danger into the, into the wild, you know? Um, but how does that explain where meditation can take these people that are just completely, from what I understand as an observer, in bliss, for, for in solitude? To be honest, I'm quite sceptical they are in bliss. Maybe they are and maybe there's kind of outlier human beings, but well, they're clearly outliers in all sorts of ways. But yeah. the bit I don't agree with in some aspects of Buddhist traditions, and I stress that some aspects of Buddhism, it's not all Buddhism, but some parts of Buddhism have contrary insight, but... Mm. The bit that's about saying about detachment from the world and saying you can't change the world, so change yourself. Be- learn to become detached. Learn to see it as just a veil of shadows on a cave wall, sort of thing. I don't agree with that. Mm. I don't think that, and I, don't, I think the evidence actually shows that doesn't, for most people, doesn't lead to happiness. Actually, you think about, for example, think about the guy with the cow, right? Guy has his leg blown off, he's working in the field. Yeah. He didn't need someone to say to him, well, life is a passing veil of tears, yeah. it's all an illusion, <laughs> you know, you need to detach yourself from these feelings of pain. Yeah. He needed a fucking cow. He just wanted right? a cow. Yeah. That's right. Do you know what yeah. I mean? He needed people to buy him a cow. Mm. And I'm more minded, look, it's not this, I don't want to be too simplistic there's a lot of things that can be improved by changing your perspective on them and changing your and detaching from, from anxiety and so on. I'm, mm. I'm not saying there isn't, there is this value in those things. I'm a bit more minded towards practical social change than that. Mm. And when people want to retreat from the world, part of me thinks, well, good luck retreating from rising sea levels. Cause someone needs to go and stop the people who are, you know, causing the rising sea levels, mm. right? As a degree to which, you, you exist on a, in a world mm. and that world is changing and that world has all sorts of forces in it. And you can, re- it's like there's a book called, uh, <laughs> I really like this, uh, a writer wrote about this. There's a book called No Impact Man mm. about a guy who tried to live for a year, I haven't read it, a guy who tried to live for a year with no carbon emissions at all. And the New Yorker writer, Elizabeth Colbert said, you know, you could have spent that year campaigning to reduce emissions and you could have called it <laughs> Impact Man, right? True. And I kind of think this kind of weird, I actually almost think it's a kind of, I don't want to be harsh to this guy, I've read no, this no. Book, but I think there's a kind of, a kind of narcissism actually about saying, well, I will uniquely, I don't know anything about, I'm being really unfair to this guy, mm-hmm. but there's a kind of narcissism going, well, I will make myself morally pure and that will be my contribution to the world. Mm. I think we don't need your fucking moral purity, mate. We need the world to be made better mm. by practical action. Mm. It's a bit like, Gandhi, who I admire in many ways, but have you seen Gandhi's advice to the Jews during no. the Holocaust? <laughs> Fucking shocking. Uh, I might be getting some of the context wrong, but um, I think a, a Jewish guy writes to him during the Holocaust and says, what should we do? That might not be how we get it, but the advice is, def- the bit I'm, bit I'm is definitely right. Gandhi said they should all commit suicide because that would morally blackmail the, the Germans. It would make them feel bad. <laughs> and then they would feel... And I no, no, they nah. didn't. They didn't need the Jews to kill themselves. In fact, that would have delighted the Nazis. That's yeah, what they were aiming for. Totally. What they needed was someone to go and intervene mm. in the fucking horrifying situation and stop the Nazis. Mm. And I do think this kind of um, the kind of make yourself pure and that's the way to make change. I, I, I'm quite allergic to purity politics. No one's pure. Mm. You're never going to be pure. No. We're all messy, compromised individuals, and what you want to be is part of the mess and the compromise, mm. making the world better, not 
exempting yourself from the mess and going to a cave to have your lovely blissful. I don't believe it will be blissful, but mm. maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there will be some people who experience it as Depends blissful. Depends what's in the cave. That's true, <laughs> yeah. A couple of Sally, pills, yeah. Sally, perfect. <laughs> Sally. Good for TV. Sally, Sally, being a cow <laughs> yeah. and a Netflix subscription. You're laughing. Exactly. Sally. Exactly. <laughs> and a copy of my book. What yeah, more do you right. fucking want? Yeah, just audible. Yeah, exactly. Right. Me on audible on a loop <laughs> just speaking to you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, so Even when you sleep. Exactly. Exactly. Perfect. So here's what I think about that. I'm just interested to hear your thoughts. It just, and I, I guess this um this this is probably going to sound a little bit woo woo, but it's just it's from my experiences, I guess, with the the psilocybin and some the, the MDMA and stuff as well. But um, I kind of feel like um, if we are spirit beings in a human shell, because um, I take on that spiritual aspect, it really helped me coming from having this OCD fear of, of um, you know, I would burn in hell for the afterlife and then OCD having to pick up rubbish all the time to prove to God I was a good Samaritan. Swung the pendulum. The only content that I was obsessed with was Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, you know, Matt Dillahunty just frothing on hating, like, you know, aggressive atheists, like much more probably, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, not as healthy as probably the way you see atheism. But um it was what I re- came to, to realize was that was actually just a suppression of fear that I still had for the afterlife, you know? And then um, coming a little bit more to terms with myself and not taking on any sort of religiously institutionalized version of, of spirituality, but just something that a connection I have with, um, you know, I'm not the most important thing and there could be something out there, whatever it is. But the way I see it is if we are these spirit beings in a, in a human shell, we're, we're put on, we're, we're each seven and a half billion of us are, are put on this earth to, to try to make it. Um, to leave it in a better way than we found it. You know, we have a responsibility to, to be, to laugh and have fun and interact with people. And I think what really helps me is it, I try to always connect with myself as best I can. And like, it's, you know, I'm nowhere near as good as the, the big dogs out there, but I try to be a little bit more authentic, I guess, every day so that then I can feed my ego in a way that's actually going to do right by the way that I was put here to do it. And um, that's something, I don't know, what I guess experience or if that just developed over time but um, I guess if we don't have that I feel that if we don't have some sort of connection to ourself you know it's just going to be hard to um, you know benefit others you know they're totally right and Sam and Richard are both friends of mine and I, and I like it about mm. them very much even when I don't oh I love their stuff by the yeah, way yeah yeah, no, yeah. The, 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 you're right I've slightly shifted my perspective on this mm. I used to be quite I'm still 100% atheist. There's no part of me that thinks there's actually literally a God or anything. Yeah, but, yeah. But I'm more inclined now when confronted with religious people to think about, well, what need is this meeting? Like I spent a load of time with this Amish community for the book, for Lost Connections. Um, and, you know, Amish have the lowest level of depression in the United States. Mm. And you go there, I know there's a lot I disagree with about the Amish, a hell of a lot. You can see they've got something we haven't got got a sense of very deep sense of community got very high equality horrifying gender inequality but the but within men and within women the richest Amish man is as wealthy as the poorest Amish man and the richest Amish woman is as wealthy as the poorest Amish woman Mm. they've got a very deep sense of connection Um, I think that's true I think it's also the other thing you said that's so important to me is humour right I just think you know, I think almost more than I think I'm most patriotic about as mm. a British person is our sense of humour, right? Mm. It's one of the reasons I love Australia is that I feel mm. Australians have a very similar sense of humour. And I think that just I have a, it's almost like before almost anything else I believe in, I think you, you I have a deep, it's the closest thing I have to really sense you should, life is really funny and yeah. you should laugh at and it. And it breaks down the ego wall though. Like, totally. I, I love um, laughing with people because I yeah. feel so much more connected. Of course, and one of the things I really try to do when I meet people who have very big political differences from me mm. um, and I'm trying to talk to them is try to find something we both find funny and laugh at because mm. there's something about once you've done that, it completely changes the nature of the conversation. Once you've laughed with someone, it's very hard to rage at them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And one of my heroes is uh, Joan Rivers. Do you know the comedian? Oh, of course. That Absolutely. I'm obsessed with. She's uh, great. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, uh, you know, I, feel, I still feel really sad that she, she, she died uh, like three, four years ago now. I, remember, I do remember mum texting me actually about that. Yeah. I'm gutted. One of my favourite things Joan Rivers ever said is, um, I might be getting some of the details wrong, but when she... Um, 
you know Heidi Klum, the German yeah, yeah. model. Yeah, so she's. I think I'm aware. I think uh, of her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine yeah. you've looked at her in ways I have not. But <laughs> the uh, so Heidi, I think this is what happened. Heidi Klum's on the red carpet, and she says to Joan Rivers, you know, um, oh, I don't want because Joan Rivers used to comment on dresses on the red carpet. She says, uh, oh, I don't want to talk to you. You're going to say I look terrible. <laughs> and Joan Rivers said, terrible. You look amazing. The last time a German was this hot, they were shoveling my cousin into an oven. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just think, if you, what, what you have to do, what I love about Joe Rivers, her, her life is, if anyone, have you seen the documentary about her, A Piece of Work? No, no. I really recommend it. It's yeah, right. It's a fucking amazing documentary. Yeah. What she's a great example of is someone who turns pain into humour. That's right. Like her husband killed himself mm. and, uh, in 1987. And very soon afterwards on stage, she makes this joke. She goes to stage and says, I knew I shouldn't have taken that paper bag off my head while he was fucking me, right? <laughs> and I just think you've got to have that capacity to turn... If you can turn your pain into humour... Mm. I mean, you're, the, the one of the, we were talking before about, you know, your pain has is a signal it means something. Mm. One of the things pain can do is it can help us to understand other people's pain and it can help us to find humour, mm. right? It's not, I don't think it's a coincidence that the two groups who are famous for having the best sense of humour in the world, the Irish and the Jews have probably the most horrific history in the world, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it's not a coincidence, no. right? The, 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 so I do think there's... I, I have very deep belief in, in laughter mm. and in finding things funny and the things that connect us all as human beings are kind of ridiculous. We are ridiculous creatures and we are funny creatures and, you know, we all stink and fail and, mm. and fuck up and I really... I'm just a very strong believer in in just engaging with people against that rather than exactly it comes back to this theme we were talking about all the way through it's kind of ego way of thinking which is so kind of I mean it's very interesting James Comey the former FBI director in his new book says he never once saw Trump laugh in all the time he worked with him really and I think that's so revealing mm. and Trump Trump doesn't ever laugh in public he makes jokes about people mm. he's sometimes actually a bit funny I don't think he's got no sense of humour but <laughs> yeah. it's always a kind of cruel jibe at someone else Yeah, it's not is it possible to imagine him laughing at himself? I can't imagine any self-deprecation to be evident there. And no, it's literally... It's, I would say it's impossible in his personality yeah, structure. Yeah, yeah, He couldn't do it, mm. right? The, the, and I think, that, again, that tells you something about his very poor psychological health. Mm. An individual who can't laugh at themselves, I think, is very psychologically unwell. Mm. And I think almost the worst thing I could say about a person is that they were humourless. Well, everyone... Everyone isn't perfect, and I guess that if you can't oh, laugh from me, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, please, yeah, sorry, we'll, yeah. we'll edit that out, Fuck mate. You, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. I fucking hate you. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. um, it's going so well until that yeah, moment. I know, you I can't just screwed it up. Exactly, I offered you a Tim Tam. Uh, exactly, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you're exactly right. Look, if you can't, if you can't laugh at yourself, then you lack any sort of sense of self awareness. You know, you have no idea who you are, which is, um, which is scary, which is I think really scary. Yeah. Johan, uh, oh man, I would love to just talk for you forever, but I understand I've got to um, got to move on at some point. I just wanted to ask you, um, what's uh, what's next for you, and what um, I guess what's the what's the big the biggest takeaway you took from from your book and the the, the direction that you you'll probably um, head towards now. I think there's loads of things, but the, the, one of the things that from the reaction to the book mm. that is so moving is people are so hungry to talk about these things. Mm. People so come to you when they hear it. They they, they, they want to talk and think about these questions in a deeper way. They know there's something wrong in what we've been doing. They know there's something wrong. That we've been missing big parts. Of what's wrong is that we've been missing big parts of the picture. So I'm really moved and, and kind of... Um, I just feel really touched by that. It, 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 the most moving thing in any... It's happened with my previous book, Chasing the Screen, which was about addiction. Mm. The most moving bit for me in any process of writing a book is when the people I've written about tell me that people who've read the book are contacting them. Because that's this moment when you feel wow. like you've made a connection. Like I remember I had this incredibly moving moment in Chasing the Screen. I tell the story of this... One of the best people I know, this woman called Lee Maddox, who was a cop in Baltimore... She fought a really... She was a very hard drug warrior. She used to bust people having a single joint. She went through this amazing transformation that I describe in the book. She quit her job as a cop and she retrained as a lawyer and tried to get the convictions of lots of the people she had busted overturned, right? Mm. Lee's an amazing person. Mm. And I remember doing an event in Baltimore about that book at an amazing bookshop called Red Emma's and people getting her to sign the book and that was to me so much more moving than 
asking me to sign yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. There's this moment when you feel like Leah's an amazing person. She's done this amazing thing. It wasn't very well known. It's better known now because mm. I spent so much time with her and got to know her. And, and her example has inspired other cops to join this amazing organization called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition who fight to end the drug war. And to me, you get these moments when you feel, and this has now started to happen with Lost Connections because it's been out for about four months, mm. where some of the people I've written about are going, our people are contacting me, they want to know more about this, they, they want to hear about it. And to me, that's such an exciting thing where you feel you've been able to make a connection between something that, you know, because I went and met all these people and I thought, wow, what an amazing, you know, the pe- I generally don't write about people that I don't like mm. or think there's something important about. It's a couple, I don't do, you know, none of my books are really have kind of villains in them. Yeah. Um, so they're mostly people I think I want to hold up and go, this is something you should know. Mm. This is someone who discovers something interesting. Not, of course, some of them I disagree with on some things, but so those, m- those moments of connection are really important for me. So I've always got a couple of books on the go because the most expensive bit of the work I do is the research, basically. Because yeah. you tra- I travel a lot for my books. Of course. Because I want to sit with people. Um, so... Um, I'm writing a book about how people change. I'm really interested in that. I've been doing research on that for a few years. Mm. Uh, how people change their minds, how people change their personalities, how people change their characters, how we change each other. Mm. Um, I write a book about why we can't focus, problems with attention. Mm. Um, and uh, the long-term one is, you know, there's an American intellectual called Noam Chomsky. He's an amazing man. Don't know, no. Yeah, he's an incredible person. I feel so dumb. You're mentioning all these people. Do you know Donald I'm Trump? A, I'm not yeah, yeah. Really aware of, uh, you know but Chomsky, uh, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, You've heard of yeah. that one, yeah. He's back at home, actually. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, a mushroom cap. And- exactly, exactly. He's watching us now. Too, <laughs> That's but right. The, uh, <laughs> no, he's this with guy us. called Noam he's Chomsky. With us all. <laughs> there's this amazing guy called Noam Chomsky who... who um, I've been writing a biography of for a while, but that'll take forever because his life is super complex. So mm. I'm in this very lucky position where I can kind of take time to think about these things. And to me, the great kind of luxury of what I can do and the, to me, the value of books, right, in this culture where there's so much noise and so much screaming, the value of, the, to me, when a book is valuable, it's when someone's been able to go, I went away and thought about this for a long time. Yeah. And I met lots of people and these are the deep thoughts I think are valuable. That's to me what the value of books, not the kind of, you know, Twitter screaming and all of that. You can, anyone can do that. Mm-hmm. You can, you know, if you, if your depth is 280 characters yeah. or whatever it is, then you can say any old shit. That's you know? right. You know, but the, but to me that kind of depth and, and focus is, is the value of it. And, and so, yes, I'm just in this really lucky position. I'm going to carry on doing those things. Right. I should say, because my publisher, my amazing publicist Hermione, who you met, t- tells me off if I don't say this. At the end, so I've got this kind of, all right, it's advertising spiel I meant to say. <laughs> if you would like to know where you can yes. buy yes. the book, Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions, <laughs> or the audio book, if you would like to know what a range of people have said about the book, from Joe Rogan to Russell Brand to Hillary Clinton to Elton John, mm-hmm. um, if you, or to the Sydney Morning Herald, if you would like to take a quiz to see how much you know about the causes oh, no. of depression and anxiety, and if you would like to hear audio of lots of the people we've talked about, go to www.thelostconnections.com. It's not lostconnections.com because there's a fucking band called Lost Connections. That oh, know about. Yeah, yeah. That's classic. They haven't existed for ages, yeah. so, but they're very nice. They're very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. No, no disrespect to them. Uh, who own Featuring all the IP. The big farmer. <laughs> exactly. And uh, what's the thing I meant to say? Oh, yeah, people can also find out where they can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, although I did an interview recently where at the end they said what's your Twitter what's your Facebook what's your Instagram mm. and then they were like what's your Snapchat and I was like I'm a 39 year old man right <laughs> the only 39 year olds yeah. on Snapchat are certainly paedophiles yeah, yeah. and they should be immediately arrested yeah, I, will, right, yeah. I will go a long way to get my message out I'm not fucking going on Snapchat True. right like life is I will die one day man. and I will never get back the time I spent on Snapchat yeah, so exactly. yeah so you can Jesus find all that same. information it's thelostconnections.com Oh, Dude, cheers, Tom. Thank really you so enjoyed much, that. I loved it. It was oh, great. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. Oh, it was like, uh, it was just, I uh, like, uh, like I told you before, it was, as soon as I heard you on Rogan, I was like, I've got to do it. And I just thank you so much for just emailing me straight back, man. Oh, it was awesome. So I totally really, really love it. Yeah. Cheers. That's a wrap. Go for the deploy.